I want to use this opportunity to say thank you to the whole team of SNI and SF for having me here. As you could see, I'm having a great time in Seattle so far, even on the weekends. Um, um, as been mentioned, I'm working at one of the nine BG hospitals in Germany. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term BG, BG stands for uh, Berufsgenossenschaft. Um, they are basically one of, uh, or they are the German uh, workers' liability insurance company. And they've always shown a strong commitment, not, over, not only towards um, helping the injured worker, but also in order to find new ways uh, to prevent work-related back injury or work-related disorders in general. So this is why we as orthopedic surgeons were able to conduct such a study. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any disclosures yet, which I should mention. Um, and as being said, I'm from Bochum, Germany. Bochum is in the most western part of Germany. It's a, quite small town compared to Seattle with 400,000 inhabitants. Um, and it's located in one of the largest metropolitan regions in Europe called rhine ruhr area. And the rhine ruhr area was formerly known for coal mining back in the days. And my hospital has a strong association with coal mining. If you look at the name Bergman Tile, that means uh, curing the injured coal miner, more or less. So uh, we were founded in 1888 um, with the beginning of the coal mining area in this, in this region. And um, we always had to treat those badly injured coal miners. This is actually the last coal mine facility in, uh, next to Bochum that was closed down a couple of months ago. Um, it's it's kind of sad for the region, but probably good for the environment. So we don't have to treat much more of these guys. You can see in the right picture. This is a, a picture how coal mining was maybe 100 years ago. And it's easy to imagine that this guy will have um, several issues with his back when he's done with working. Because back in the days, there were no robots, and there was no um, way on helping those guys in the coal mine. But despite the fact that there is an ongoing trend towards industrialization and mechanization, there are still quite a few people um, in the working environment exposed to physical workloads. And these physical workloads are causing uh, work-related disorders. And the most important one is probably lower back pain. And it's not only a problem for the individual, but also for society, because there's a lot of cost involved into the treatment and to the, this whole problem of work-related lower back pain. So if we want to find a way to prevent it, we first have to think about um, how it's developed. And Alex, I don't want to talk. Can you go back? That looks like a big pedicle screw they're putting in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Are you sure they're doing coal mining? I'm not, maybe it's an OR in the, in the back in the days. And so if we want to talk about this whole issue of low, uh, lower back pain, um, we have to understand it. And I don't want to talk about it in detail because it's quite complicated. But in, in general, um, you have to imagine that if you're trying to lift a certain amount of weight from the ground, um, your uh, lower back muscles have to uh, compensate a certain lumbar moment. And if, if, you're, not, um, if you're not strong enough to, to compensate this lumbar moment, this lumbar moment creates certain forces um, that are causing your lumbar disc and your intervertebral joints to suffer. And this is maybe one of the parts in the development of lower back pain. So um, as I already mentioned, there is a strong um, development towards industrialization and mechanization. But there are certain working fields where we don't, we, we don't want industrialization and we don't want automatization, because I think nobody wants to miss an empathetic nurse in the hospital. But the problem we have, um, as we saw in the last case as well, we have a lot of patients that show increasing uh, body mass index, and um, the nurses in the hospital have to handle this in some way. And this is a cartoon showing an old nurse trying to lift this obese patient from his bed, and it's already made crack in her back, so she, she probably has already severe back pain. And uh, the younger nurse in the, in the back um, mentioned some kind of lifting device they could use to help her. And you can see it actually in the back of this picture. This is one of the so-called uh, off-body lifting devices, and it's actually not new at all. The picture on the left side is out of a surgical textbook from Germany. It was written in 1823. And they already had this idea of these lifting devices. And even in 2019, we used the same lifting device in the hospital. And um, I just can say in Germany, they don't use it that much because they have like certain issues. First of all, they need a lot of time to use them. And the nurses uh, on our wards, they don't have that much time. Secondly, um, they are not in every room, so they have to go get it, and they need at least two people to use them. And as long as it is within the human capacity of lifting, they probably do it without one of those devices, because it's not that useful. Um, so what other options are there? This is a quotation of McDougall. And what he's talking about is basically the fourth industrial revolution we are currently witnessing. And the fourth industrial revolution is um, 
it's marked by emerging technologies in different uh, fields, for example, in robotics or in another field, um, the field of exoskeletons. And this is one field we want to talk about in detail. Um, this is a picture on the right side. We all know that it's an, ex an endoskeleton of the human body. We are all fami familiar with that. And on the left side, that's actually a dragonfly nymph. It's an insect. Um, and the reason why I put on this picture is this insect has an, endo uh, an exoskeleton. If we look at the term exoskeleton, it's from the Greek language. It consists of two parts. Exo just means outer and skeleton. We all know what that means. And during the next slide, I want to talk about some aspects of those exoskeletons. Um, and they could be defined as external wearable structure that enhances or supports the human body. Um, there are different types of exoskeletons. The first one I want to talk about of those exoskeletons, they're called or classified as passive exoskeletons. The reason why they're classified as passive is they don't use any actuators. Um, on the left side, this one is called PLAT. That means personal, personal lifting assisting device. It was developed in the Netherlands. It's basically a metal frame with some elastic banding in the back, and it's meant to support your posture during certain tasks, for example, in the automobile industry. On the right side, this is another exoskeleton. Uh, they actually tried that in the OR. They uh, let visceral surgeons do a long uh, laparoscopic surgery, and this exoskeleton was meant to um, allow some relief of their upper extremities. Um, there are some problems with those exoskeletons, and probably the most important like concern is um, the issue of muscle deconditioning. And so this was the first step in the development, so the people put out passive exoskeletons without any actuators. The next step with this development on the left side, it's actually one of those Japanese exoskeletons. It's called muscle suit. And those are classified as active because they use some kind of actuators to get movements done. Um, the left one, for example, used pneumatic muscles. Um, the right one, probably electricity. And um, the difference is, compared to the other exoskeleton I'm going to talk about in a few slides, is they are classified as active, but they are not controlled in a voluntary mode. So it's basically just on or off. You push a button, and those uh, pneumatic actuators do a movement for you, but you don't have any voluntary control about it, just on, off. The next thing I want to talk about, and Dr. Chapman briefly talked about it already, is um, this company called Cyberdyne. The guy in the right upper picture, that's Professor Sankai. He's um, the CEO of Cyberdyne and also professor at the University of Tsukuba. He actually invented this whole HAL technology. And um, <clears throat> the big difference between the HAL technology and the other exoskeletons we talked about is the control mode. Um, the HAL detects, they call it bio, bio signals. It's probably just a surface EMG in order to control the movements of the exoskeleton. Um, here at SNI, we could show striking results regarding the use of HAL exoskeletons in uh, new rehabilitation. And um, they developed another exoskeleton. It's called Hold for Care Support Lumber Type. You can see it here in the picture. It's basically just a half annular frame that weighs about 2.9 kilogram. It has two um, actuators attached to each side. They are located slightly above the wearer's hip. And <clears throat> this frame contains several um, sensors, a three-axial uh, three accelerometer and the pontiometer. Um, and therefore, this robot is able to know where we are in the room, so it can differentiate between if we want to keep or like be stable in one certain posture or if we want to lift up things. And this little wire you can see that connects to that um, gentleman is detecting the bioelectrical signal of our lower back muscles. And when we try to move, it translates that into some kind of motion, which is carried out by those actuators on the side. I just showed you the video show you an impression how it works. So whenever this gentleman bows up, the whole robot helps him going up and the other way around. Um, this is actually the prototype. The newer ones look slightly different. So on the next pictures, you will see the newer version, which we tested in Germany. So the thing was, um, as I said, the BG hospitals are always interested in finding new ways in preventing injuries. But they actually use this exoskeleton in Japan at the airport or in certain, I think, in a coal mine as well. But there has not been any scientific proof that it, they really work. So uh, we thought about a study which we recently published. It's just a pilot study, and we had basically three key questions. The most important one, or the most important concern, was is there really any influence of this exoskeleton on our lower back muscles or the myoelectric activity of those muscles? Secondly, we wanted to know if there is uh, a possible influence of using such an exoskeleton on the general uh, cardiovascular response of the whole human body. And last but not least, well, we wanted to ask the subjects who actually use this exoskeleton if they do feel any difference while using it. Because 
um, when, when a nurse or some guy in a coma and does not feel any difference using the exoskeleton, they probably won't use it. And we have to know if it causes some kind of discomfort by wearing it. So <clears throat> we included 14 male patients. We had some restrictions on the BME because um, as being developed in Japan, this half annular frame can't be changed in size. So you can't get it for a normal German person probably. And so you had to look for a healthy male participant. They did not have any sort of back um, pain or back-related disorder in their previous history. Um, we asked those guys to conduct a symmetrical lifting, lifting task. So they lifted a 7.05 kilogram heavy box from the ground to a table and back to the ground. Um, the lifting page was, was given to them using a metronome. So they lifted four times a minute. And while they were lifting <laughs> this box, we recorded an ECG, which we needed for further calculations regarding the heart rate variability. Uh, furthermore, we used a mobile spiral ergometry to prove if there's some kind of influence on the metabolic uh, or on the cardiovascular system. <clears throat> we uh, used the box scale. I will talk about it in a few slides. And last but not least, we measured surface electromyography from the lower back muscles, from the lumbar and thoracal erectospine. Um, and now we want to talk briefly about the results of our studies. This is a slide that shows the results of the mobile spiral ergometry on the right side. You can see one of my colleagues um, in the whole setup. So um, the dotted line in blue and red is subject one. Um, the line uh, on top reflects the heart rate, the line below the um, oxygen uptake. And to, to summarize the slide, there was no difference regarding the oxygen uptake or the heart rate um, during the lift using the hull or not using the hull. So it didn't in influence the whole organism. Secondly, this is what, what's basically the same result. We uh, calculated the heart rate variability, and we could not show any significant difference between the heart rate variability um, comparing the hall and the no hall uh, group. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. We did, everybody had to do the same task in randomized order. So we had 14 patients in every, uh, or subjects, and every subject did uh, the hall and the no hall experience. Um, <clears throat> the second thing we asked those subjects is the Borg scale. Um, on the right side, you can see that the Borg scale is basically a scale to rate the um, perceived extortion of the subject. Uh, it goes from 0 to 10. 0 means no uh, harm at all, and 10 means it was a very, very hard job to accomplish. Um, there was a difference between Hall and no Hall conditions, but it was without statistic uh, significance. And now we want to talk about probably the most uh, important findings of our study. We looked at the root mean square, and the root mean square basically quantifies um, the electric activity, which we measure using a surface EMG. And there have been studies that proved uh, um, <coughs> an increase in linear function between the uh, root mean square value and the load that is um, implied to a muscle. Uh, so in other words, um, if you got a higher root mean square, that means there was a higher load on your muscles. And um, our study proved that we could reduce um, the muscle load in the lower back using the hull about 4.5% at the lower, um, at the lumbar rectus spinae and about almost 11% at the toracal rectus spinae. Furthermore, we used uh, integrated EMG. That's another calculation you can get by using surface EMG. And the IMG um, reflects the, ma the muscle magnitude or the magnitude for uh, muscle force. And we could reduce the um, needed muscle force about almost 15% at the lower, um, at the lumbar erector spinae and about 21% at the thoracal erector spinae. So this is quite remarkable. So if you look back at our um, initially asked key questions, um, we, we could prove some kind of influence using the hull on the myoelectric activity of the lower back, um, but we could not prove any influence on the cardiovascular system um, or on the uh, subjective or, or on, on the, the way the subjects felt using the hull. Um, we thought about these results and we discussed them, and maybe the reason why that is the case is that they only lifted for 10 minutes each. Uh, the problem with our study was um, most of the participants were working at our hospital, and they did it after the 24-hour shift. So we couldn't ask them for more than 10 minutes in a pilot trial. Uh, we will do that in the next trial that's coming up now. Um, so to conclude, there is a potential using those exoskeletons in reducing the incidence of lower back pain, but there's a lot of work to be done before you can really use them in a working uh, environment. Our study was conducted in a laboratory setting without any uh, 
like it was a symmetrical lifting task. They don't have to do any twist movements. And furthermore, we did not analyze a possible influence of using this device on our lifting techniques. So the next study that is now being done by Dr. Yilmaz, a former colleague of here, he's um, using the same device and we're using um, motion sensors to show if there's any difference in terms of lifting technique while using this device. Uh, so there's more work to do. So if you don't have, uh, or do you have any questions so far? Sure, always. Great <laughs> job, thank you. You're welcome. So just a quick point, this is Bergman's Hall. I've had the great pleasure and honor of being there. This is the oldest trauma hospital in the world. This is little known. Uh, 1859 something? 1888. 1888. And it also had, I think it was the second hospital in the world to have a new fancy technology in it. I cannot even imagine uh, how that would have uh, happened with the VOA uh, uh, scrutiny nowadays in our tech council. But they had a technology called Röntgen uh, in there. This is the second hospital in the world that had a Röntgen machine in it. It's hard to imagine, but all due to miners, right? We're getting one. We're getting one too. I hear. I hear. Great. <laughs> we're getting. We're getting an X-ray machine. Rod, can you believe it? Right. No, but this is this is an amazing place. A little thing, by the way. Which which building built the, the building burned on down? The, the, building, the, the building on the most left of the picture burned this down. This one. Yeah. So they had an amazing uh, horror story where on the top floor here is their rehab floor. A patient tried to commit suicide. This was like four, three years three ago years or so. Three years ago, I wasn't called that night. Three years ago, oh yeah. <laughs> and a patient in this top floor in rehab tried to commit suicide, actually succeeded with that. And the amazing thing was, this is a very old building, you can't tell, but uh, this has been remodeled obviously a couple of times. Yeah. They did not have a sprinkler system in that room, but this entire building burned down. This is a fully occupied uh, bed hospital wing. Two people died, the person who tried to commit suicide and uh, the roommate. Everybody else was saved uh, because the entire hospital went into crisis mode and it actually worked, including the chairman who personally helped carry patients down. They had the fire department there. And the hospital has continued to thrive despite basically losing over a third of its bed capacity. So how, how was that, just on a side um, note? It, to be honest, the, the problem was that in this building, we have like a huge department for paraplegic patients and they live in this, this building. So the first three floors, which 40 bed each uh, is just um, full of paraplegic and tetraplegic patients, so they could not run themselves. So you had literally to carry down 120 patients uh, from this ward. So um, yeah, it was quite experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately but, not. <laughs> but uh, I was so impressed. Uh, uh, I got a news feed in the middle of the night for us when this happened. This is actually happened in the night in Germany. Yeah, one and night. the uh, organization, how they handled uh, that potential absolute disaster is uh, seriously magnificent. I mean, everybody was hands on deck. Everybody helped and was uh, flawlessly organized. This, again, could have been one of the modern day absolute catastrophes. Yeah without a question. So all of you deserve kudos. Can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah. So this is obviously one of those long held dreams that we can have modern, yeah, exactly, go, go back a little more. Modern mechanical, go back a little bit more, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, modern mechanical tools to try to alleviate this terrible shear uh, loading mismatch that we do have if our back muscles and buttock muscles are not well enough organized. If I can conclude your research right now, this does not look very promising. Is that a fair conclusion? Yeah. The problem is that um, the users did not respond too well using it. They could not feel a big difference, and that's probably the biggest problem of this device. This is just 5% difference <coughs> regarding the root mean square, which is not a lot. And um, it takes like five minutes to, to, to wear, to like put it on, but still there's, um, we would wish there would be more benefits that you could feel as a user because then you would probably use it. Without feeling the difference, there's no reason for you to use it. Even if we tell them, if you tell a nurse or some guy at a construction working site, this will reduce your root mean square about 5%, he would say, yeah, but. So this is, the very, this is the very first study on this. Yeah. The Japanese have actually simply never done this. They just told their workers to wear them, I guess. <laughs> now, the, uh, this is again was part of the discovery of Thomas in Japan. They had this magnificent technology, but they had not really done organized research. Now, forgive my naivete, but if I was to try to prove the value of this, I would do probably a three-part cohort prospective study. I would have one group wear nothing and do business as usual in their regular work day. And it has to be something with physical labor. Number two, I'd have a group wear a simple lumbar or weightlifting binder. Mm -hmm. And number three, I'd have a third group wear this kind of an outfit. 
is this, uh, uh, how did you choose this experimental model versus kind of a clinical comparison study? Yeah, so we, we talked about this actually with, with Prof. Schildhauer, and uh, we thought we go for first pilot trial just to see if there's any influence we could measure objectively. And um, the second part after this pilot study is um, anal analysis of the motion patterns you have when you use it. And when this um, shows a result we hope for, the next step would be to use this device on our intensive care unit. So we have huge intensive care units and we want the nurses to try it for like two weeks and to see what experience they have with that. And then we can go on for another trial. So we have a physical therapist here and firefighter. So talk to us about braces quickly, low back braces. Do they actually do something aside from tucking in our uh, bauch, our belly? Oh, it's a big topic in the fire department here and a number of our chiefs who have a background in power lifting wanted everybody to have power lifting belts when, um, continuously when we're on duty. Uh, which really wasn't very effective. And we looked at a large study that was done with the airline industry where they took half their folks, gave them back braces to use on a regular basis, the other half without braces. They tracked their injury rate and they found no difference between the two groups over the following year. Then they took the braces away and they found that the people who'd been using braces had roughly three times the injury rate when they took the braces away after having used them for a while. So unless they're using them during the actual process, part of the conjecture, as you alluded to, is you reduce the conditioning of the paraspinal musculature. So when they're not using the brace, now they're ill-prepared for the loads that they're subjected to otherwise. So we, sub we effectively stop those chiefs from influencing people to wear braces on duty. The other aspect is most of our lifting tasks are not unidirectional, they're multidirectional, which exactly. these are problematic for. Yeah, actually that's a good point. Like the first one, um, that's exactly the problem with all those passive exoskeletons and muscle deconditioning, and there are like several studies that have shown that, as you mentioned. And the other one is actually another good point. That's exactly the problem we have with this device. It's, it's just, we, we just tested it for like a symmetrical lifting task without any twisting, but if you look in the working environment, there's barely any task you do without twisting or bending in some kind of direction. And it might be that this device is actually impairing you in doing it because it's like, it's not too much of a construction on your back, but there's still some kind of impairment coming from this device in terms of lateral bending or twisting. And if you, if you put it on, you will directly feel that there's some kind of restriction wearing it for sure. So there might be just some fields. In Tokyo, they use it at the airport. So those guys who have to put the bag from the ground to the the band, they, they actually use that. That might be a good option, but like as a firefighter, you have to do much more complex movements for sure, so you can't wear that. Sure. And so do our nurses. I mean, it's again not a great point there, unidirectional. It's a multidirectional set. Yeah. Twist torque, it's a shear thing. So do you actually strengthen your muscles then or not? Did you do no. actual strength testing of back muscles? Uh, we didn't do that actually, and it, it won't. It's not a training device. So if you use it, you're still using your muscles. At least you, you're innovating them. But it has those two actuators. They provide about 15 newton meter torque. So um, there will be some. It's not meant to wear it all day. Probably we thought, like for example, a nurse. They do their rounds and they have to put patients from like move them in the bed every one hour on an intensive care unit, for example. And we thought that when they have to do this, we give them this device and say, okay, now for your round, we we'll just put the patient in a different position, wear that device, and afterwards get rid of it again. So don't wear it the whole day. Did I understand you correctly that you also measured the subjective impression yeah. on the... And can you go back to that slide? So what was the, your nutshell take-home message? What did they actually say? What does that Borg scale mean? And what, what did they think uh, okay. happened here? Interpret that again for yeah. us. So the Borg scale um, is basically a scale to rate the perceived <laughs> exertion during something. It was developed by Mr. Borg. And um, it goes from 0 to 10. And 0 means you did not feel any physical impairment during a task, so it was a very easy task, and 10 means you did a marathon run, basically. So we asked those guys after they did the trial with the hull, and after they did the trial without the hull, how did you feel? Give us zero to 10. And when they used the hull, uh, uh, sorry, when they did not use the hull, they rated their um, physical exertion between two and three, so between fairly light and moderate. And without, uh, with the hull, they rated between one and two, so very light and fairly light. The problem with that is there was no statistical significance between those findings. Yeah, Jeff. I mean, to me, this this sort of implies that the the effort that they had to put into it, even without the hell, was too light, yeah, right? Yeah. So meaning that you should have probably uh, at the, in the next study, you should actually have a task that's very difficult, right? 
Because I think then you may find, because there is a difference, but it wasn't significant yes. here. Yeah. But I think if, you, if it's intended to be very difficult, and yet you use a how in order to help you lift it, you may find some sort of difference there. You yeah. know? That's actually a good point. We, we, we intended to, to apply more weight for our lifting trial, but our IRB committee said if you go be beyond 17 or 5 kilogram, that's too much of a weight. And they were concerned we could do any harm to our participants back doing it. So we were restricted on 7.05 kilogram in the first trial. Um, and the second part, as I said, is um, those guys who, who participated in our study, they were colleagues of mine, and I asked them to do that after their 24-hour shift. So I was like, you have to do that for 10 minutes, or in, in total 20 minutes. And they, they started sweating doing it, to be honest. So if it's like four lifting trials a minute, 7.05 kilo, it was kind of exhausting for them, but probably not exhausting enough. So we have to go for a longer trial for sure. Well, thank you for your talk. I enjoyed your talk uh, on, on the HAL. Uh, the problem with uh, that device is that it, it teaches one how to use your back incorrectly, right? And, and we're teaching our patients in therapy is to use our backs using our thighs and glutes to lift and, and not use uh, this type of posture to lift the patient. Uh, so um, that is a, where a lot of problems can occur. And, and But looking at this, can it help prevent uh, injury to the patient's back, and that could be a, a scenario where you're looking to that as well in, in the imaging, and is there changes to the uh, person's uh, uh, um, uh, lumbar spine? Yeah. So low back strengthening, uh, put on your hat of a physical therapist. So what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I sense it was a little bit skeptical, but does this have a role at all in back pain prevention and or management right now as you see it? And how, how does this kind of play into with the recognition that back strengthening is actually a very important thing? I really don't like the term strength anymore, conditioning rather than strengthening. Um, I'm a consultant also with workers' comp here in the state, and most of our injuries occur at the end of the workday when fatigue starts to show up. It's not necessarily one large lift or lifting one large person. We certainly have the traumatic episodes. Um, for firefighters, you fall off a roof or something falls on top of you, that's traumatic. We can't do much about that. But with most of industry, we're have seen at the last hour of the workday is when most injuries occur when fatigue shows up. Uh, within our recruit training in the fire department, it's at the, the end of the work week when we have these recruits in there working 10 hours a day for five days consecutively and fatigue shows up. We get our, that's when we see it. It's not the big lifts or the big efforts where you'd be on the eight or nine end of the Borg scale. You'd be more on that sustained three for eight to 10 hours continuously. And using this device for eight to 10 hours is probably not going to be the most comfortable thing for them to utilize. Uh, also, as you pointed out, the promotion of altered lifting techniques and postures could be problematic for that. Final thoughts, otherwise we'll conclude this March 20th spine session. Thank you all for your contributions, attention, and uh, our speakers. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.